Hope you're as excited after I'm done. <laughs> if you look in your bulletin, you'll see that the um, the title of the message is uh, the Shema, the Lord's Prayer. And you look up on the screen and it's different. And so I'm going to give you the classic Jewish response to a sudden change in plans. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you who, who don't know me, um, I'm Irina Kerr, I'm a worship leader here. Um, I was raised in a family with a Jewish mom and a Greek Orthodox dad. So I have kind of a wide field of, of experience to share. And um, we've been focusing uh, in this series on the Jewishness of Jesus, which is, I think, especially fitting. At Lent, you know, we really know who the person was. This gives us an understanding of the heritage that we're adopted into. And it helps us understand what he was saying in the context of the Jewish world. And I'm not going to draw any theological conclusions for you today. I'm just going to point out a few things that I think are significant enough to spend some time <coughs> pondering. Uh, as outsiders to the Hebrew faith, I think we tend to draw a, a distinct line to determine where Judaism ends and Christianity begins. And so we've got the two books. We have the Old Testament and the New Testament, which is nice and neat and simple. And uh, my experience is life is not nice or neat or simple, ever. And uh, particularly, I, I don't believe that Jesus, the rabbi, came to earth to end one religion and begin a new one. I think rather he came to emphasize the true spirit of the law and to realign us with God. But I'm getting ahead of myself, so I want to start talking to you about the Shema. Shema is a sacred prayer. It's, it's, it's a key prayer in Judaism. You're supposed to say it four times a day. When you first get up, uh, I guess at key points during the day, and then before you retire for the evening. It's also said as part of the morning service on the Sabbath. When I was in fourth grade, I went to Hebrew school on Saturday morning, and at the morning service, Rabbi Bellin would be up there and he'd say, Join me now in reciting the watchword of our faith. Now, at the first service, I made the mistake of saying, Does anybody know what a watchword is? And of course, somebody in the back goes, Yes, I do. So I'm not going to ask. <laughs> Watchword is a phrase or a word that expresses a person's or a group's core belief, their core aim. It's actually sung and then recited in the, in the temple. This is the Shema. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. That is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Echad means one. Now, one is not a very complex concept, surely, but it's profound if we look a little deeper than the surface. Consider the word one. Okay? It's more than a number. In this line, in this watchword of the faith, it says a lot more. It says God is one, not one solitary, one alone. One with the universe. One with all his creation. One with his people. This is one as in unity. Let the oneness sink in for a minute. It is all-encompassing, right? One. Omniscient, omnipresent. One. Now I want to go back and look at the word Shema. It's translated in our text as hear. <clears throat> but that's a very flat and one-dimensional translation. Um, Shema means Hearken, or take note, understand, um, get it into your head, right? Attend. Let us be attentive to the fact. Shema is a directive. 
It requires action or response on the people who are hearing it. It means hear this and take it to heart and make it part of your living and breathing. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Let that resonate. This is pivotal because it tells us that God is involved in his creation. He doesn't just create the world and then walk away and let it run on its own. He's there. He's watching. He's invested in it. His essence, his presence, infuses creation. And if this is our understanding of God, then we start to see him everywhere that we look. We see him in nature, in the plants and the trees, in the starry sky at night, in the sunrise, little children's laughter, old couples holding hands, blah, 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 puppy dogs, kittens, rainbows, right? Yeah. <laughs> so we understand that God is involved and interested and invested in his creation, and this changes our perspective because it opens us, it opens up the possibility of having a relationship with God. When we get that idea of oneness as a goal, we can become whole people. That oneness is, is wholeness, it's a promise of wholeness. And I want to share with you a clip from uh, a movie. Now, this is one of my favorite films of all time. It's The Frisco Kid. And it's about a Polish rabbi making his way across the country to get to San Francisco, to a congregation that's waiting for him. And um, he falls into adventure, you know, along the way. And the movie is, is really, it's comedy. But there are very poignant passages in this movie. Um, Gene Wilder is, is the rabbi, and in this clip that I'm going to show you, um, he's explaining to the Indians who God is. And I want you to pay attention to just his attitude, his, the way he expresses the nature of God. Could you play Wakanda, great spirit on that. Wonderful. Wonderful and nice dancing. Nice does not make rain. Yes or no? Can your God make rain? Yes. But he doesn't. That's right. Why? Because that's not his department. But if he wanted to, he could? Yes. What kind of God do you have? Don't say my God. He's your God too. Don't give it to us. We have enough trouble with our own God. But there's only one God. <laughs> what does he do? <laughs> he can do anything. Then why can't he make rain? Because he doesn't make rain. He gives us strength when we're suffering. He gives us compassion when all that we feel is hatred. He gives us courage when we're searching around blindly like little mice in the darkness. But he does not make rain. that he could explain everything about it. Just that God is important in our lives and that we're important to him. In the temple, after we recite the Shema, this is followed by a passage from Deuteronomy 6, which we heard earlier, instructing us to love God with all of our being. Now, we always recited this part of Deuteronomy as a prayer. It was, it was actually in our, our prayer book. And I'd like you to listen for a minute. Um, in fact, just, just close your eyes and listen to the words. Okay, parking, okay? <laughs> Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be upon thy heart. Thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt speak of them when thou sittest in thy house, when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. Thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thy hand, 
and they shall be for frontlets between thine eyes. Thou shalt write them upon the doorposts of thy house and upon thy gates, that ye may remember and do all my commandments and be holy unto your God. We're instructed to keep these words close, to make them live for us. And the Jews take this very seriously. Orthodox Jews wear tefillin or phylactery. You can come in. Come on in. <laughs> Phylacteries. We have a picture of those. Can you put that up on the screen? Okay. Tefillin are two small black leather cute shaped cases that contain Torah texts that are written on parchment. One is one on the left arm. And the, 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 the parchment part it faces your heart. The other one is worn on the head. So that the law, the Torah, is right here, right in front of your eyes. You always have your eyes on it. Um, <clears throat> in fact, the one that they wear on the head has four different texts in it. Uh, Exodus 13, about the Feast of Unleavened Bread and another passage about the consecration of the firstborn to God. Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9, which we just read. And Deuteronomy uh, 11, 13 to 21, where God tells the people, follow my commands and I will bless you. And be careful not to turn away and not to worship other gods. So these are reminders of, of, of God and of the obligation to keep the law during our daily life. Now, Jews don't evangelize, at least not in the way that, that we do. They don't send out missionaries, they don't proselytize. But historically, they have brought other people to God by living in a righteous way. That is, they evangelize by example. It's the way that they live. It's people like, what is it with you people? What is it with you? Tell me about this God. Why is he so great? Right? The chief was saying, he doesn't even make rain. Why is he that important? And then we have a chance to share. That's why it's so important for them to keep the law. The Jews also put a mezuzah on the doorposts of their house. This is a mezuzah. It contains a scroll inside with the Shema written on it. And the scroll is put inside this decorative box and it's mounted on the door. When you go into the house, touch it. To remind yourself the law is important here. When you come out of the house, Touch it again. Like, whoop, take it with you. Its presence reminds us to infuse our daily go doings with holiness, with good deeds. So, let's review where we are so far. Adonai Echad, God is one. And that oneness pervades all of creation and includes us. That is the promise of oneness and wholeness. Now, how do you think we get to be whole? We follow the commandments. God commands us to love him. We love him by finding out who he is. And that's why we read Torah. That's why we obey the commands of the Torah. We refer to the Torah as the law, but it's really much more than law. Can you put up the next picture? In the temple, <coughs> the Torah are kept in a... Um, a, com a the case. I can't think of the word. It's the Torah Ark. That's right. <laughs> Very good. All of these scrolls have the same first five books of, of the Old Testament on them. They come from different places, usually from different countries. Poland, Germany. They're written on vellum, parchment. They're usually hundreds of years old. They're treated with respect at all times. They're covered with a mantle and they're decorated with um, silver. Silver trappings, you know. You are you are very reverent when you open the Torah art. When you take one out, you lay it down and you open it to read from it. You don't even touch it with your hands. You use a, a silver pointer uh, to, to read along you know, when, you, when you read it. Um, when we read the Torah, when we read the law, we discover who we are in relationship to God. You know, the Torah is a history. It's a history of the human relationship with God. It's a chronicle of his love and the people's wandering. 
And it's also the best way to understand who he is, because he speaks to us. And when you look at the law, what do you see? These laws center around how we interact with our neighbors, our relatives, our friends, and our enemies, and our rulers, and with God himself. They're the rules that tell us how to live and how our hearts should be. Mostly they tell us how we should treat one another. So to review again, because I'm really big into the review thing, Adonai Echad, God is one. We see him everywhere. And because we see him everywhere, we start to see him in one another. We learn the law so that we can treat each other with respect, and with mercy, and with kindness. If we keep these concepts right in front of our eyes, as we're instructed, always in our minds, we have a genuine desire to honor God by the way we live, and by the way we treat one another. Now, when we started, I said that I didn't believe that Jesus came here to end one religion and begin a whole new one. So I'm going to catch up to that point right now. Uh, a lot of us draw that line between the Old and the New Testament like this. We say the Old Testament equals the law, and the New Testament is all about grace. Well, yeah, it's about grace. But some people say that Jesus set aside the law and gave us grace instead. But I don't think so. I don't think he put aside the law to any degree at all. I mean, he was a rabbi. He loved the Torah, and he knew the law, and he understood it more intimately than any of us could. Because he could see it from the perspective of eternity, right? He sees it, and he sees us from God's perspective. And if you recall, Jesus told the Pharisees that they were misrepresenting the law, that they loved the letter of the law, but that they had lost the spirit of it. In Matthew 22, 36 through 40, when asked which was the greatest commandment, Jesus said, Love the Lord with all your heart, mind, and strength. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the laws and all the prophets hang on these two commandments. So maybe... The law really is love, if we look at its essence instead of the letter. It is about mercy. It is about redemption. It is about forgiveness. The commandment, love your neighbor, is not a departure from the law. It is a culmination of the law. It's the natural result of the law. It's the spirit. It's the essence of the law. Jesus highlights it for us because the Israelites had lost sight of it. The spirit of the law is to love one another because that's the best way to express our love for God. Or as Bill and Ted knew, the spirit of the law is be excellent to each other. And that's all I have to share with you. Thank you.